morning. Good morning. Welcome to Prairie View Christian Church this morning. My name is Zach, and it is my privilege to welcome you. You're not on? Oh, you know what? I muted this thing. There, there we go. I just, rookie. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome again to Prairie View Christian Church. Uh, it's my privilege and honor and joy to welcome you here this morning. Uh, as we get started here, I'm going to go through a handful of announcements, things that you can find in uh, the bulletin that as you hopefully may be received on your way in this morning, or perhaps things that you've already read in the Friday email, but you can never communicate too much. So a few things that are going on here. One is we, we do have youth group today, and we are actually going over to Pinheads to go bowling. Um, we do lots of trash talking in our youth group, and so this will be an excellent opportunity to continue that tradition. Um, so we're going to go bowling this morning uh, following church. Uh, we will have men's group again, not this next Friday, but the Friday after that. We just met um, this past Friday. We are working through the uh, book, The Cross of Christ by John Stott, um, working through different sections of scripture that go with the chapters of that book. Um, you do not have to be reading that book to participate. Um, you do not have to do any reading in advance to participate. Uh, and if you're like me, you don't even have to show up on time uh, to participate. You can be several minutes or 10 minutes or 20 or 15 minutes, whatever it was this past Friday late, still show up and take part and uh, everyone will be glad to see you there. So that's the men's group that's led by Joe Fenimore, and we meet here in the lobby every other Friday at 7, give or take, um, every, other, every other Friday morning. Um, our next meeting, again, is on the 20th. Uh, also coming up in the life of our church is the 33rd anniversary meal, which is incredible, um, yeah, it's incredible. The 33rd year of ministry here with lots of people, some who have stayed through it all, uh, lots of new faces, uh, but lots of faithful uh, men and women, families, kids who have grown up here and who are either still here or gone off to do other things. And uh, it's a reason, as good a reason as any to celebrate. So that is coming up on the 22nd. If you are interested in decorating a table, um, or bringing food, hopefully you're interested in bringing food, there's a sign-up sheet on the welcome desk in the lobby. Another thing coming up is our women's group is going to resume after a brief break. That will also be um, starting this month on the 29th, and that will be after the service, but not immediately after the service. So it's listed at 11.50, so it's enough time to maybe go and get some food if you need to and bring that back. It's 11.50 until 1.20. There's six weeks on the miracles of Jesus, and that is led by Mary Paffer. Um, so if you have any questions, please do reach out to her with that. Um, this morning, we are going to begin a new sermon series entitled Minor Details, which is going to cover, take us through those maybe sometimes pesky books at the, old of the, or at the end of the Old Testament, which are known as the Minor Prophets. And this morning, we are going to hear from Jonah. And so I'm going to read from Psalm 145, starting in verse 8, and then I'll pick back up in verse 17. So this is Psalm 145, starting in verse 8. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. And then jumping down to verse 17, the Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for um, this day that you've given to us. Uh, God, help us to be mindful of the gift that you have set before us, uh, even now in this moment. Um, that our life is a precious gift from you. Um, 
and, uh, and help us rejoice in that and, and find hope and comfort in that, God, that uh, whatever highs or lows we might be experiencing as we've come to this place, um, you have a plan and you have a purpose, and your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your control, your power is, is complete, and your goodness is too, and help us to find comfort and joy in that. Um, as we move forward in our service this morning, God, I pray that we would be the people you have called us to be, um, that as we lift our voice in song, as we bow our heads in prayer, we would be an encouragement to one another, and we would bear witness to um, each other and, and also to the world around us of your character, who you are, um, your goodness, and, and your power, and ultimately the good news, the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for, uh, as we come up on 33 years of ministry here at this church, thank you for your uh, witness and testimony in the, in the sustaining of this church and the building up of these people here. And as things have come and gone and people have, have, have moved through here and moved on, um, God, your faithfulness has been the same through it all. And help us to uh, continue to walk in that faithfulness, to trust in your faithfulness, and to trust in your promises to us that um, we would honor you and serve you. Uh, God, I pray that you would, again, just be honored and glorified in what we do here this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, at this time, you may have noticed the band has not come up. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce you all to Dan Hillen, who is a, you can come on up, Dan. Um, I won't be long. Uh, Dan Hillen is a local missionary that we have been supporting for, I say we, we as a church have been supporting for over 15 years. Um, he works locally in student ministry, which is something I care about deeply and uh, matters tremendously. And um, so I'll go ahead and hand it over to Dan at this point, and you can hear some updates from him. Thanks, yeah. Dan. Hey, thanks, Zach. Hey, good morning. Uh, behind me and in front of me is a picture of my family. Um, my wife, Jana, uh, we celebrated 20 years of marriage this summer and got to go to Italy, which was a dream come true. Um, my oldest, Micah, is a junior at Fishers High School. Uh, my daughter, Alana, is a freshman at Fishers High School. Uh, and then Joel is in fifth grade and Jude is in fourth. And so that is my family. Uh, it is a weird and wild thing to have your kids a part of your ministry. And so I remember when they got into junior high going like, what are you doing? Oh, you're supposed to be here. And I was just this weird, like the, my own kids are in my ministry. But it has been so fun to see them flourish and use our ministry as a way to get their friends plugged in and hopefully experience Jesus. Uh, for those who don't know Youth for Christ, I'll just real quickly say our heartbeat and our passion are kids that may never darken the door of a church. Um, so everything we do is aimed at how do we, how do we introduce kids to Jesus? Uh, and so I'm at Fishers Junior High. I'm at Fishers High School. Um, it has been a while since I've been here, so I'm going to try to keep this short because I know Ben has probably prepared a sermon that he would like to get to at some point this morning. Um, but let me give you just a quick flyover snapshot. Um, if you'll go to the next picture. So this is back in May. This is our senior club. Um, we had 40 seniors that we just graduated that were part of our ministry. 14 of those were on my student leadership. You can go to the next slide too. Just um, Not all of them made it this, but I want to give a snapshot of the journey that we've been going through over the last few years. So COVID hit, and we had this hard reset, um, as a lot of people did. Uh, but there was a group of students that I had just started student leadership. Uh, they were eighth graders at Fisher's Junior High. We met three times, and the last time we met, we went home and found out, hey, you're not going back to school again, and we're not doing face-to-face. -face. And it's like, whoa, we just started. Like, I, I'm getting to know these kids. But it was this group of kids that they were faithful. They jumped on the Zoom calls, and they, they kept doing that when everybody else stopped. When their freshman year rolled around, we sat under the awning of our church, outside, under this thing, six feet apart, social distance, doing all the stuff. Um, and they showed up at six something in the morning faithfully. Sometimes the lights would go out, sometimes the lights would be on. Um, and we met and we gathered. Uh, until it got to about 28 degrees, and I'm pulling out the space heaters, and we're trying to stay warm, we're hunkered under blankets. And I finally asked my church, can we maybe go inside? It's a little cold. But I share that to say that was their dedication. 
And so you fast forward to sophomore year, we're able to gather again. We've lost our seniors. We've lost the kids coming up because we weren't able to have large group gatherings. And it was this group of students that we rebuilt ministry. Um, and we got a few weeks in, and we started club, and I think 12 kids showed up to the first club. I'm like, oh, <laughs> we were 60, 70 pre-COVID, and this is a really hard reset. And so we're kind of going through it, and I had this aha moment a few minutes in going, or a few weeks in going, I'm casting vision to a group of students who have never seen high school campus life. Let's re-pull back, let's relay foundation, let's recast vision, let's help them catch what it means to use this ministry as a tool to reach their friends with the gospel. And by the end of that year, we were averaging about 25 kids coming, but it was their junior year that things exploded. Vision set, vision caught, and they had just this energy behind them, and we had 60 kids coming on an average week throughout their junior year. Fast forward to senior year this year, and here we are, 70 on an average showing up. Um, but what's unique about that is they were laying foundation. They were reestablishing culture. They were creating space for students to come and go, hey, this is safe. Uh, this is a place where I can discover who God is. I don't have to have all this biblical knowledge and this backdrop. Like, I can just come as I am. Um, and so the numbers aren't what excite me, but the opportunities for the gospel to be shared is what excites me. And the more and more kids getting exposed to the ministry that we get to do. And so I say all that to kind of set that over here. And I want to just kind of wrap up with a story. Um, last year, um, we're sitting in our student leadership meeting. And a girl shows up that, I mean, our student leadership is really Christian students who have a heart to reach their friends with the gospel. And then usually it's kind of by invitation um, of who comes. So Thursday mornings we meet. Um, and this particular morning, a girl showed up that I'd seen at club. I knew her name. We'd had some kind of small conversation, but I didn't know she was coming. And so she shows up and she sits down. I'm like, hey, so good to see you. So glad you're here. Um, and one of the things I challenge my student leaders with every year is, hey, who are three to five students that you see on a regular basis that, to your best knowledge, may not yet know Jesus? And I'm just going to challenge you to pray for them. And all year long, every time we meet, you're going to hear me say, hey, are you praying for your friends? If not, why? Because there's incredible power in prayer. And then the other thing I ask every week is, hey, anybody have any God stories? And what I mean by that is, where are places where you've seen God show up in your life or in a friend's life? And I just want to share so that we can all be encouraged, because we all hit some dry spots. And so let's encourage each other by what God is doing. And so this particular morning, uh, I asked the question, hey, anybody have any God stories? And one of my seniors that was on the screen a minute ago, or still is, one of my seniors said, I've got a God story. Claire was on my core list the last couple of years I've been praying for her, and she's here this morning. And Claire just kind of got this look on her face like, what? She had no idea. And then she got this smirk on her face. She goes, that's pretty crazy because last year I was going through a lot of hard stuff. And God started to get a hold of my heart and get a hold of my life. And campus life was the place where I started to discover Jesus. And I put my faith in Christ. And that's why I'm here this morning. And we're like, talk about God's stories. Like, this is why we pray for our friends. Because when we pray, God is faithful. And so two weeks ago, I'm sitting in church. Um, and I get this text message from Claire. So I'm in service, we're almost wrapping up, and I get this message from Claire that says, Hey Dan, I'm getting baptized today, and I just wanted to express my gratitude for all that you and Campus Life have done for my faith. Thank you for creating space where people can see the light of Jesus and for fostering such an amazing culture. So when we talk about relaying foundation and culture, Claire got to experience that. It was a safe space. She could journey, she could experience Jesus, she could be in a place where she could receive what God had for her, and it changed her life. And so you better believe that I'm on my phone texting people that I know goes to her church going, hey, what time are you doing baptisms? I'm almost done here. And I shot across town and had about three minutes to spare by the time I walked in the door and she got baptized. And if you want to show the next slide, um, this is Claire. Uh, and one more. It was such a sweet moment to see this and to experience God's faithfulness through this student. And I could share lots of stories, but this happened two weeks ago, and it felt really appropriate to go, man, this is the stuff that God has been doing through this ministry. Uh, and so on behalf of Campus Life Youth for Christ, I want to say thanks to you guys for partnering with us. 
Uh, it has been 15, 16, 17 years. I think, Nancy, you were one of the first people I met when I came in town. Um, and this journey has just been a sweet journey. And so thank you for partnering with us. Thank you for helping us reach more students. Um, and we are grateful for that. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Zach. I will stay up here. Thank you, Dan, for being here and sharing. Um, you know, I'm sitting there thinking about what, what I will say and what's fitting and, um, and any, either, any number of things. God's faithfulness, the power of prayer, um, the encouragement, I hope, that I've, and that I've received this morning and hopefully you all have received as well. When we get up here week after week and we, we pray our prayers over our offering, which honestly at times is, feels a little forgotten, to be frank, can feel forgotten because it's overshadowed by communion. Uh, with the way we do service. When we pray these prayers, we ask God to help us be good stewards of our money. Um, we ask you to be faithful in giving. These are the kinds of things it's going to. And it's years of hard, years of hard work and fruit that we, will maybe, that we will never see. But on a morning like this morning, you share that with us. And God is good. God is big. Um, he's bigger than the four walls of our building here. And it's good to be reminded of that. So with that, we will pray, and then the band will come up and join us, and we'll keep moving in this service. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you um, how you take your people and sometimes just little pockets of people, and through those little pockets of people, your kingdom is spreading. And uh, through the faithfulness of people in this church, many, many who are not here this morning or, or who aren't here at this church anymore, um, but who are still worshiping you elsewhere. Uh, through the faithfulness of your people and your faithfulness to us, God, you have spread your kingdom and the gospel uh, to places that we might never get to, and, and that place might just be the high school down the street. Um, God, the world is so big, but it's also so small, and it's on mornings like this where we realize just how little I think we're capable of, but how great you are and how powerful you are and how your reach just goes and goes and goes. And so help us to trust in you. Help us to trust in your reach. Help us to trust in your faithfulness. And uh, whether we see the fruit of our labor or not, help us to know that you are, are, are working and that you have people uh, who are working in places we can't and might not ever see. Uh, thank you for Dan and his family, and I'm sure the time, even this morning, that they're giving up with him so that he can be here and, and stand in front of us and be an encouragement to us. Thank you uh, for the, the way you, have I'm sure, have provided for them through the ups and downs, and uh, I, I pray that you would protect them, their whole family, um, and in doing so, you would allow them to continue their ministry um, first to each other uh, as husband and wife, as as father and mother, um, and then to the students around them and to the, the students in our community, God. And, and who knows if one of those students might not walk through our own doors and make a difference here. Um, humble us and cause us to rejoice in your goodness and faithfulness to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Psalm 511. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may exult in you. Stand before your maker, full of wonder, full of fear. Come behold his power and glory, yet with confidence draw near. For the one who holds the heavens and commands the stars above, 
is the God who bends to bless us with an unrelenting love. Rejoice, come and lift your hands and raise your voice. He is worthy of all praise. Rejoice, sing the mercies of your King. of a father who will never let them go. Rejoice, come and lift your hands and raise your voice. He is worthy of all praise. Rejoice, sing the mercies of your King. Here we trade. walk this path before us he is walking with us still turning tragedy to triumph turning agony to praise there is blessing in the battle so take heart and stand amazed rejoice when you cry to him he hears your voice First Peter 1, 3. It says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Yeah. 
reading is from Ephesians 3, and this is verses 14 through 19. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Here is a love vast as the ocean, loving God. As a cup when the prince of life our answer shed for us his precious blood. Who is in love when I remember? Who can cease to sing his praise? He will never be forgotten.
Good morning. My name is Rick, and I'm part of our leadership team here at Prairie View. And with that, I have the privilege in leading us into communion this morning. And after a short meditation and prayer, please come forward and pick up the uh, communion elements and take them back to your seats and partake during several quiet moments that we'll have to spend together. And you may bring your offerings and deposit them in the black boxes on my right and my left. Well, today, Ben kicks off a new sermon series, as Zach mentioned, called Minor Details, that will take us all the way through Thanksgiving, and more specifically this morning, Pastor Ben is going to preach on the book of Jonah. Most of us know the basic story of, of Jonah. Jonah is chosen by God to prophesy the destruction of the evil city of Nineveh, but he attempts to escape his divine mission, and he runs away, and he actually gets on a ship to run away farther, but as hard as he tries, he can't escape God's wrath. And God's judgment. And then a great storm comes about, and it's about to doom the ship when the crew actually becomes aware that there's a Jonah aboard. And while I was preparing this meditation, I actually learned that mariners actually have a term called a Jonah. It's a long-established expression among sailors um, to mean a sailor or passenger whose presence on board brings bad luck and endangers the ship. As the storm rages, Jonah finally admits to the crew that he's running from God, and he actually encourages them to throw him overboard, and they didn't want to, but they eventually did. And then, of course, we know that the waters calm, the storm ends, and the ship is saved. But Jonah's troubles are about to go from bad to worse. He's swallowed up into the belly of a whale and remains there for three days and three nights. But he repents of his sin and God relents, and the whale spits him out, and he survives. Well, there's a lot more to the book of Jonah, and I'm going to leave that to Ben to teach us later this morning. In Judaism, the story of Jonah, it is read during the afternoon of Yom Kippur to instill reflection on God's willingness to forgive those who repent of their sin. In the Old Testament time, sin was punished, but those who repented, forgiveness was given. Today, Jesus, our Lord and Savior, provides the same forgiveness and grace. For those that believe in him, your sins are forgiven, and we have the promise of eternal life with God in heaven. Communion is a time for us to come forward and thank God, thank Jesus, for his, the punishment that he endured on our behalf. Uh, but it's also a time that, as it says in Paul, or Paul says in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. So this morning, as you come forward to eat and drink, examine yourself and place your sin and or your burdens before Jesus' holy throne. And like Jonah, you will have the grace and forgiveness of your repentant spirit. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for your Son's sacrifice on our behalf on the cross. Please accept our acknowledgement that we are sinners of the first degree and we're truly in need of your Savior Jesus. Father, if there's any among us that are struggling with sin that's uh, unrepentant, I trust that uh, 
they will have the courage to reach out to maybe one of our pastors, perhaps one of our elders, or perhaps a trusted brother or sister in Christ so that uh, they can discuss the sin and how that sin is creating a burden in their life and how to get to the point where it's something they are sorry for and that they can repent for, and then that burden is no longer in their life. Thanks for your grace and forgiveness for our repentant spirit. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice, for all that believe in you and repent. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. morning. Welcome to Prairie View Christian Church. Thanks for joining us here today. Well, as stated earlier, over the next 12 weeks, we're going to spend our Sunday mornings curled up in our vests like Dan. Game, respect game. I love my vest too. We're going to curl up in our vests with a classic fall combination of pumpkin spice lattes and the minor prophets. But don't let the word minor fool you. Because these 12 books, while they 
may be small in size compared to prophets like Isaiah or Jeremiah or Ezekiel, are anything but minor details. In fact, each is massive in terms of its importance. The Twelve, as many Jews call them, teach us a great deal about God, teach us a lot about ourselves, and though the prophets couldn't see it quite as clearly as we do, they teach us about the future we look forward to as believers in Jesus. So we're going to read these 12 books in chronological order, as in their historical timeline, rather than canonical order, as in how they're listed in the Old Testament. And that means that we start today with one of my personal favorites, and the one that we might already be most familiar with, thanks to Vacation Bible School and Veggie Tales, and that is the book of Jonah. So, open your Bibles to Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. Feel free to use one of our Bibles if you didn't bring one, and take a Bible home if you don't have one. But before we go further, let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this time that we have together. Thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your Word, and thank you for your church. And again, your church is comprised of far more than just this little corner, this building, this little group of people meeting at Prairie View. As we've seen this morning from Dan's updates, uh, there are things that you are doing through your church in this community, in this world, that we might never really see with our own eyes. But you are at work, and that is encouraging. And that gives us reason for hope, gives us reason for confidence, gives us reason for endurance, to press on in obedience and faith and worship and all the things that you command us to do, because we know that those things do not come back void. And Lord, I pray that you'd watch over us as we read from your word this morning. Thank you for the book of Jonah, this incredible story that we get to read, hopefully one that we haven't heard so many times that we think we already know it, or we take it for granted. Lord, give us fresh eyes and fresh ears as we come across this story this morning, and help us learn what it is that you have to tell us from this incredibly unique portion of your word. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for Christ's death, Christ's resurrection, that we remember at communion. And Lord, thank you that you will come again in power and glory. And I pray that until that time comes, you would find us faithful. And just being here on Sunday morning is one small piece of that puzzle. So I pray that it would be beneficial for us and honoring to you. We love you. We thank you. We praise you. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Well, out of the 12 minor prophets, the book of Jonah may be the most unique of them all. First of all, most of the book is a story rather than announcements or speech. We're not primarily reading Jonah's words. We're reading about an event in Jonah's life. But second... Unlike the other minor prophets, we hardly hear Jonah preach at all. The other 12 books are chock full of sermons, but Jonah's only real preaching is a single sentence in chapter 3. And third, what makes this book unique, is that the people who hear Jonah's incredibly short sermon are not his fellow Israelites. That's who prophets typically preach to. But these people are as far from God's people as you can imagine. It was a unique audience. But really, the single biggest difference between Jonah and his 11 prophetic colleagues is this. Jonah is a bad prophet. He's a bad prophet. Commentators describe him with words like ridiculous, pouty, foolish, surly, bigoted, ill-tempered, and peevish. And I agree with every one of them. One could even argue that the book of Jonah is a handy guide about what a prophet should not be and what a prophet should not do. But this strange and at times hard-to-believe story of a bad prophet 
somehow manages to teach us a great deal about our good God. And along the way, it also forces us to ask ourselves some difficult questions. So, starting in chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Look at how many times the word Tarshish is repeated in those opening verses. It's just stressing that Jonah's going somewhere else. Verse 4. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot wouldn't you know it, fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? And Jonah said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. A Hebrew prophet has one job. Obey God. More specifically, the prophet must go where God tells him to go and say what God tells him to say. And Jonah does neither. He isn't just neutral. He doesn't just kick the can down the road. He is downright disobedient to the point of actively working against God. Instead of going east some 500 miles to Nineveh, Jonah sets off west some 2,000 miles to Tarshish. So the first thing we learn about this guy is that he has no intention of obeying God. He had one job as a prophet. But by doggedly refusing to do it, he has effectively tendered his resignation. But before we come down too hard on Jonah, it's worth noting that he had some pretty good reasons for not wanting to go to Nineveh. It was far from home and rough terrain. Traveling there would be extremely demanding. And as we said earlier, they're not God's people. Preaching a message of judgment to Assyrians was not on the standard prophetic job description. 
But the most obvious excuse that Jonah had was that Assyria was one of Israel's greatest enemies, and they were notorious for their brutality. Assyrian kings were known to brag about cutting off their enemies' arms and legs, gouging out their eyes, making piles of their heads, burning their children, and using their skin as wall coverings. So how do you think they would have reacted to a Hebrew marching into town and telling them that their city was about to be destroyed? You can't totally blame the guy for hightailing it the other way. So Jonah's got some good reasons to not want any part of Nineveh. We'll grant him that. However, we'll learn at the end of the story that Jonah didn't try to avoid Nineveh because of logistics because of cultural differences, or because he was scared of getting killed. Jonah's reasoning is far more sinister. And in chapter 1, he would rather die than violate those convictions. But God had other plans for Jonah, and those plans don't include Tarshish. So that's when God sends the storm. And while those sailors tried desperately to save themselves and Jonah, all hope seemed lost. It was only casting Jonah into the water that calms the raging sea. And at the end of verse 16, it seems like Jonah got his death wish, doesn't it? But before we move ahead, let's compare those pagan sailors with that Israelite Jonah. The sailors call out to God. Jonah doesn't. The sailors fear God. Jonah claims to, but also disobeys him. The sailors have the moral compass to recognize that fleeing from the Lord is a terrible idea and that throwing Jonah into the sea is a barbaric injustice. Meanwhile, Jonah's the one running. And Jonah's the one who suggests taking a swim. It seems like Jonah is more pagan than the pagans. Because being thrown into the sea to appease an angry god is a very pagan thing to do. But ironically, after those sailors throw the bad prophet overboard, they come to believe in the Lord. Maybe he's not a bad prophet over and against his best efforts to be one. But we continue, chapter 1, verse 17. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, And you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you, into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. So Jonah's not dead after all. God doesn't just send a storm. He sends a fish. And for what it's worth, Jonah's prayer in chapter 2 really is quite moving. He finally calls out to God. He finally remembers the Lord. He finally expresses confidence in his salvation. 
Jonah's a changed man, right? Well, maybe, or maybe not. Now, why do you say that? Because even Jonah's prayer raises a few questions. First of all, does Jonah ever clearly repent of his sin? It doesn't really seem so. Second, in verse 3, Jonah seems to think that he's the victim here. As theologian in residence Tom Coors likes to say, Jonah's having some trouble with his pronouns. In verse 3, he says, You cast me into the sea. Did God cast him into the sea? Did the sailors cast him into the sea? Or was it all Jonah's idea? I think we know. And third, Jonah's words in verse 8 just seem a little bit arrogant. Those idolatrous sailors in chapter 1 who seemed much more responsive to God than Jonah was, Jonah now seems to be throwing them under the bus. As one commentator puts it, this prayer contains the right words, but it comes from the wrong mouth. But maybe I'm being too negative by calling Jonah a bad prophet. Perhaps he'll prove me wrong when he gets a second chance. And that's what we see in verse 3. Chapter 3, verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. It's almost verbatim, the opening chapters, opening verses of the book. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey. And he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's the sermon. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. The sailors said something almost exactly identical. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. When we think about the book of Jonah, the fish is often the first thing that pops into our minds. But the most shocking event in the story is not a person surviving three days in a fish's stomach. It's the Ninevites repenting. Those people who like to chop off body parts. They repented. Now, to his credit, Jonah is more obedient to God this time around than he was before. But he still seems a bit reluctant. Nineveh was a huge city, one that required three days to really experience. But Jonah only goes a single day's journey in. And when he does preach, it's that short sentence. If you put it all together, it seems like Jonah's doing the bare minimum. But guess what? Once again, Jonah's stubbornness doesn't prevent those degenerate Assyrians from believing, like the sailors on the boat. They immediately, thoroughly, and passionately repent. And guess what else? God spares them, just like he spared those sailors. Now, Jonah celebrated God's grace in chapter 2. 
Surely he'll do the same thing in chapter 4, right? Chapter 4, verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And Jonah said, Yeah, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plant, for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? That's how the book ends. And if we're still trying to give Jonah some benefit of the doubt, maybe chapter 4 can open our eyes to the inconvenient truth. Maybe logistics really were part of Jonah's refusal to go to Nineveh. Maybe Jonah really wasn't so sure about cross-cultural preaching. And maybe Jonah really was scared. But in verse 2, we learn the biggest reason that Jonah ever got on that boat. More than anything, Jonah did not want the big, bad Assyrians to experience God's grace, mercy, and love. Jonah didn't want them to repent. He wanted them to suffer. Jonah knew deep in his bones that God was good. And Jonah simply could not stand the thought of those people experiencing that goodness. Just the possibility brings back the death wish that he had in chapter 1. And even in the rest of chapter 4, as God deals with Jonah so patiently, we see no change of heart on Jonah's part. If anything, Jonah may be hoping that God comes around to his way of thinking as he sits outside the city, rather than trying to conform his thinking to God's. Jonah is bothered by the sun. He's bothered by the wind. He's bothered by his precious plant dying, all while being totally unbothered by the thought of Nineveh burning. God's grace makes him angry. But temporary comfort makes him rejoice exceedingly. The sailors repented. The Ninevites repented. But in chapter 4, Jonah does not. Now, I'll be honest. I'm not going to apologize if I ruined your picture of Jonah. Because we all know that some of the best lessons come from the biggest failures. It's often said that if you want to be good at something, spend time with people who are great at it and imitate them. If you want to be good at basketball, go play with Michael Jordan. If you want to be good at golf, go play with Tiger Woods. 
But we also know that there's truth on the other side of the coin. If you want to be good at something, spend time with people who are bad at it and then do the opposite. Observe bad examples and learn from their example. Jonah is a bad prophet. He's the worst. But in the story of a bad prophet, we learn a great deal about our good God. And we learn a lot about ourselves. We learn from the book of Jonah that God is gracious, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and eager to relent from judging those who turn from their sin and toward him in repentance and faith. God saved those pagan sailors. He saved those evil Assyrians. He even cared about their cows. And God's character, especially when it's set next to Jonah's, is incredibly good news. Because in the big scheme of things, we too deserve judgment. We're no better than those sailors, no better than those Ninevites, no better than the hard-hearted Jonah. But as the Apostle Paul says in Romans 5, 8, God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We learn a great deal about God's character in the book of Jonah. But we also learn from Jonah that God's people, if we're not careful, can fall into the trap of trying to determine who's worthy of God's grace and who isn't. In Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16, Jesus warns his disciples against that sense of entitlement by telling a little parable. The owner of a vineyard hires five groups of people to work for the day. The first group starts bright and early. Second group starts a little bit later. The third and fourth group start even later than that. And the fifth group doesn't even begin until it's practically closing time. Yet the master pays them all the same amount, even when the first group complains that it's not fair. But the master insists that he's allowed to be as generous as he wants to be to whomever he wants to be, regardless of how fair or unfair it might appear. We Christians can sometimes commit the same sin as Jonah or those workers. We elevate ourselves and denigrate others. We start to think that we're a bit more deserving of God's grace than those people over there. And when God is kind to those people who don't meet our standards, when his generosity seems a bit unfair and maybe goes a bit too far, it rubs us the wrong way. But we don't get to decide who benefits from God's grace and who doesn't. As one author puts it, the book of Jonah forces us to consider our own narrow-minded conceptions of grace. It is good for us, yes. But is it also intended for people, gasp, who are really bad? The Ninevite's fate answers that question. So we don't get to withhold the gospel from our own personal Ninevites. Those people whom, in our sin, we'd kind of like to see God punish if we're being totally honest. And we certainly don't want to imitate Jonah when God does forgive him. In Matthew 12, Jesus warns the Jewish religious leaders against demanding signs from him. They had already seen plenty, but refused to believe. So why would this time be any different? So instead of giving them yet another sign then and there, Jesus tells them about a different sign that he would soon perform. As Jonah emerged alive and well after three days in the belly of a fish, Jesus will rise after three days in a tomb. 
But Jesus also warns the religious leaders that if they do not believe in him, they will be condemned. Those awful people of Nineveh who repented of their sin and called on the name of the Lord, they'll be forgiven. But if the religious leaders double down by continuing to reject Jesus, they will be condemned for their sin. In this book of Jonah, God sent a storm. He sent a fish. He sent a plant. He sent a worm. He sent an east wind. And this same God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to save sinners. He's done this because he is gracious, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and eager to relent from judgment. And that's good news. But it's not just for us. It's also for our own personal Ninevites. And it's good news for all who call on the name of of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time that we've had together. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you that you are more gracious than we are. Thank you that you are more gracious than Jonah was. Thank you that as hard as we might try, we don't get to decide where your grace goes and where your grace doesn't go. So, Lord, I pray that rather than trying to reserve your good, kind, generous character just for us, that we would embrace the fact that your good, kind, and generous character can also benefit people who are nothing like us, people whom we could never bring ourselves to forgive. You are more than willing to forgive. So I pray that you would align our hearts and align our minds and align our wills with your heart, your mind, your will, so that we would be willing and ready to forgive those whom you forgive, to love those whom you love, to show grace to those whom you show grace to. I pray that you would help us imitate your character more and more day in and day out by the power of your spirit rather than imitating Jonah's, or rather than just falling back into old sins of our own. Thank you that you are so gracious, so kind, and so merciful. You've saved us, and we celebrate that, and I pray that we would be just as enthusiastic in celebrating the salvation of others. We love you, we glorify you, we thank you, we ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing. Praise the Lord, His mercy is born. Stronger than darkness, new every
Thanks again for joining us here this morning. Uh, the book of Jonah seems very foreign and far and removed and odd to contemporary hearers like us, and it is in a whole lot of ways. Uh, but the God of the book of Jonah is the same God that we gather to worship here every single Sunday morning, the God who is gracious, merciful, compassionate, eager to relent from judgment. And if you have any questions about what it means to call on the name of the Lord— which in our context includes calling on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, then by all means, talk to an elder, talk to a pastor. We would love to have that conversation with you. And before you leave, be sure to say hi to Dan, pray for his ministry moving forward. Uh, it wasn't brought up earlier, but Dan is both a Kansas City Chiefs fan and an Alabama Crimson Tide fan, which makes him like one step removed from a Ninevite. Uh, but we will continue to pray for him and pray for his ministry. And again, thanks to Dan for joining us. And be sure to talk to Dan and pray for Dan in the week ahead. So with that, I will close our service in prayer. Let's pray together. Father, again, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time that we've had together. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Uh, Lord, thank you that, again, your grace is more far-reaching than it would be if we were the people in charge. Uh, so it's good that you're the one in charge, not us. But I pray that you would slowly but surely conform our hearts and conform our minds to your will. Help us love the things that you love. Help us desire the things that you desire. Help us say the things that you say and do the things that you tell us to do. Lord, help us be good prophets in this world and day and age that we live in who are eager to preach the gospel in all of its fullness and all of its beauty to those around us, even those who don't meet our quote-unquote standards. I pray that we would be generous with the gospel and that we would welcome those who repent of their sin, welcome those who believe in you, even when they don't look like us or sound like us or act like us or even if their track records are a little more questionable than ours. Remind us that in the big scheme of things, playing on the book of Jonah, we're all in the same boat. We're all in the same boat of desperately needing your kindness, desperately needing your forgiveness. And Lord, thank you that you are so much more generous with those things than we are. And the person and work of your son, Jesus Christ, proves it. So help us be faithful to you in the week ahead. Help us take the gospel with us wherever we go. 
And I pray that we would call on your name, no matter where you send us or what you tell us to do, and that through our influence, other people would call on your name as well in faith. We love you. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Praise the Lord, His mercy is Lord. Stronger in darkness, new with more. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. That's what I did, though, at the end. <laughs> I tried to jump in, and then I was like, ah, and then I messed it all up. <laughs>